Are you ready to embark on a journey of success? To discover your true potential in the untold stories of careers in life sciences. Welcome to Pathfinder by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. With your host, Tommy Soares, discover the untold stories of industry scientists and unveil the secrets to excelling in your career. Thank you for joining us once again, and remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome, everybody, to another Pathfinder episode. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on Pathfinder, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Eric Lim, Dr. Lim received his PhD from Brown University in 2011. His work focused on using computational biology and high throughput genomic techniques to identify functional splicing elements in the genome. Eric has over a decade of postdoctoral experience in the biotech industry and is currently the director of data and informatics at Orna Therapeutics. Before Orna, Eric led a team of talented computational scientists and experimental biologists at Stoke Therapeutics to leverage antisense oligonucleotides as a therapeutic modality to treat the underlying cause of genetic diseases. He has over 24 publications and patents in RNA splicing, and his work has led to numerous awards, including the 40 Under 40 in Cancer, in addition, Eric is a member of the COVID-19 International Research Team. He also currently serves as a scientific advisor at Everlum Bio. Welcome, welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for taking time to speak to us today. It's such an honor and pleasure having you on the program. Thank you very much, Tommy. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be invited to, to give this interview and, and hopefully the interactions will be productive for your audience. And, and besides, a uh, very nice introduction. So thank you. My mom doesn't say so many nice things about yeah. me. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's it's really, it's such a, a incredible journey that I can kind of see a little bit from your LinkedIn page. And I've been excited to talk to you to see how it all unfolded. Um, and maybe, I don't know, going back to uh, Brown University or even before your, your studies at Brown University, take us back to as far as you want to take us and tell us about this journey that you've gone through. Sure. You know, I I always joke about uh, this statement that that I am made in Malaysia uh, and polished in America. Uh, um, so, so I was born and, and raised in Malaysia. Uh, I went to North Texas for college, uh, studying computer science and, and mathematics. Uh, and I was, you know, pretty fortunate to be exposed to research relatively early in my academic training. So at that time, uh, I, I had an interest in graph theory, or, or maybe that I was led into believing that I had an interest in graph theory. Um, you know, I was I was 19 years old, uh, zero clue about what I wanted to do, and, and I barely spoke English at that time. So, so you know, I would do whatever, uh, basically, <laughs> If you were willing to risk it and gave me an opportunity, I would do it. Um, but we were we were learning on how to leverage graph uh, as a data structure to represent high dimensional data. Uh, and then we apply various uh, traversal graph algorithms uh, on the data structure for computational analysis. And, and many of which were biological data as well as uh, epidemiological data. And, and that was sort of my entry, you know, to this exciting world of computational biology. Um, then I went to Brown for my master's degree, uh, also in computer science. But in addition to the degree and during that time, 
I work as a coder, as a programmer uh, at a biochemistry lab studying uh, RNA splicing. So by the time I was about to finish my master's degree, I was going through the interview process because at that time, I just wanted to go to Google. That was sort of the, the, the dream that, that I have. Um, but the PI of the biochemistry lab asked if I was interested in, in joining the PhD program in his lab. So that was sort of how I, I started uh, from, from a, a bachelor in computer science to sort of ended up with a PhD in molecular biology um, and, and started my career as a computational biologist. Uh, and I was also very fortunate. So, so this whole life journey, it was, was just very fortunate <laughs> um, because I, I graduated in 2011. Uh, so that was right after the recession. Uh, and there was this major shift in the field that we were moving from microarray to next generation sequencing. And, and so out of the sudden, the need for bioinformatics scientists, the need for computational biologists just basically increased exponentially uh, at the very juncture that I finished my PhD. Um, so I was able to, to skip postdoc, uh, and then I went into the industry uh, directly. So since then, um, I have worked on several compounds, um, tavozanib, which is a VEGF inhibitor for retina cell carcinoma, uh, H3D 8800, that is a splicing inhibitor for various types of blood-related disorders, uh, that I spent about one and a half years at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, working on this concept of proteogenomics, where we combine RNA sequencing with proteomics to identify uh, novel transmembrane proteins, uh, specifically for CAR-T therapies. Uh, then after that, I spent about uh, seven years at Stoke Therapeutics, where I think we'll, we were trying to leverage antisense oligonucleotides as a therapeutic as, as a therapeutic modality to increase gene expression uh, for diseases uh, with haploinsufficiency. Uh, and now uh, I'm at Honor Therapeutics, a circular RNA company. Uh, my role here is a little different uh, from from my career background uh, in that we are building a data platform to facilitate uh, the FAIR principle, F-A-I-R, uh, which stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, our, our goal is to increase the overall data culture and data hygiene to catalog all of the digital assets that we have in order to increase uh, reproducibility uh, such that for every digital asset that we accumulate, there will be an uh, an audit trail, if you will, that shows you where that data came from, uh, what had been done to that data in order to promote this idea of a single source of truth. Fantastic. That's <laughs> so fascinating. That is incredible. Um, my gosh, Eric. And so... So I have a lot of questions. I hope you don't mind me asking. I don't have um, a lot of answers. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is about you and your life. So hopefully you have a few answers. Maybe, you know, maybe you can explain to us a little bit. What was it that you were passionate about in terms of computers or do you remember what how you got into computation anything computers and yeah uh, you know the whole career wasn't really planned for uh and and i think it, it sort of went back to uh my family um, we we grew up in a family full of engineers, and, and it's actually a funny story. Feel bad for my father. Um, he based so so the strategy for him was that you know he sent all his kids to college studying different disciplines, with the expectations that we were all gonna go back home to help him develop this this business idea that he had. But so my my oldest brother was a 
a software engineer. Um, the other brother was a mathematician and I was a computer scientist. So that was sort of my father's plan to, to have all of us go back and develop um, this idea that he had. Um, but then none of us went home, right? <laughs> so, so I sort of grew up in a very technical background. Um, my father taught me how to program, I think when I was 10 years old, uh, it was it was done in, in the MS-DOS 3.1 version. So for those old people, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and so it was sort of a natural transition for me to go from, you know, in, in a very technical background into computer science. It was very comfortable. Um, and then, like I say, just now, the, the end goal was, you know, I'm going to get my degree. I'm going to go work for Google. I'm going to get rich. I'm going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then but then everything sort of took a turn um, because I started doing research very, very early, I think during my sophomore year in, in college. And, and I think that was uh, first semester and senior year in college. Uh, I was working with uh, this professor, Fahad Shiroki. And, and Fahad asked me to come in, you know, we have our regular one-on-ones and he was like, hey, Eric, are you interested in going to grad school? Because that was never part of the plan. And, and I say, you know, I never thought about it. What do you have in store for me? And, and what he did change my life. It was amazing that he picked up his phone. He called one of his friends at Brown, um, Roberto Tamasia. So he was the chair of the department at that time. And he just called him right in front of me during our one-on-one. -on -one, and he's like, hey, I got this student. Uh, he's interested in pursuing a graduate program. Do you have a spot for him? And, and that was sort of how I got there. Wow. Um, and, and then when I was <laughs> uh, when I was in a master's program because of this job that I had with a biochemistry lab. And again, you know, when I was in a master's program, the whole concept of PhD was never there. Um, in fact, I, I got an offer from Wall Street being a quantitative strategist. Uh, and then while at the same time, you know, the PI was asking me if I wanted to join his lab. Um, and I'm glad I didn't go to Wall Street because it was right before the recession. <laughs> <laughs> you dodged the bullet. <laughs> I know. So, so it, it was all very, very fortunate. Um, and, and so I was able to to, to have the transition with the help of these very nice people. Um, and, and because typically getting the admission into the molecular biology department was pretty rigorous at Brown. Uh, and then me basically was a lab rat because I came from a complete different background. Uh, but because the PI was able to vouch for me and he already had funding for me to be a, a graduate student in his lab. So they took me in uh, and I was I, I spent I, I was in the lab doing transfection, doing transformation, pipetting uh, for a number of years. And my, I still remember the first time my hand was like shaking. I could never get the pipette tip to go into the tube correctly. <laughs> um, so I went through that process and then again, fortunate because of the transition from microarray to next generation sequencing, got my first positions and then everything else is just history. My goodness, that was one of my questions. I wanted to ask you if you got your feet wet in molecular biology and biochemistry and all this stuff. I mean, if you were studying splicing mechanisms, were you actually in the lab isolating genetic material, RNA, DNA, and so on? But it sounds to me like you were uh, in the lab. Uh, and so... <laughs> I it it sounds it sounds like such a eye opener. Had you ever taken any biology, chemistry, or biochemistry courses before? No, oh, I hated biology growing up, and, and I I remember telling the chair of the department that I might be the only graduate students in the department who had never heard of the word mitochondria until first semester in grad school. <laughs> and oh. I, and I, I would say that first two years were just brutal. Um, you know, the, the first semester, uh, we, we, we weren't required to do any research. They put us in a very intense 
class that you meet four to five hours a day, every single day, you read about six to eight papers every single day. So it's like this massive journal club that you come in and you present uh, and you exchange ideas about the materials and methods. And, and so I, I still remember this, right? Of the first day we were assigned about, I think there were six papers. I picked the paper from science because it was the shortest. Little did I know that was the hardest paper to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but you know I managed to to survive through that course. Um, but what I've come to learn is that biology is like a story. Um, that as you learn more and more about the background, uh, it, it becomes more manageable to build a, a the the novel concepts on top of those backgrounds. Uh, and I always sort of remind myself that. Um, you know, in, in the world that we live in, we live, we we have to conserve currency. But in, in the world of cells, they have to conserve energy. And, and so a lot of these biological mechanisms, as far as, far as I understand, uh, ultimately lead back to that conservation of, of energy. So if you are able to do things as efficiently by consuming less energy, uh, and that will probably be how the cells evolve into that mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That, that, that makes sense to me too. And it's, it's such a, it's an interesting way that, uh, of being able to evolve in uh, the, where the water can flow easiest, right? Mm -hmm. Where the energy can flow easiest and there's no interruption. But so it sounds like your time at Brown was a wonderful time of growth Tell us a little bit. I so and and I don't want to say that the University of North Texas was not. It sounds like you had a wonderful mentor there too that said, "Hey, we I see something in you, and I want to put you embark you in a path here." Uh, and just with a phone call like that, getting you out to Brown, and how was that? that time at Brown? I mean, what was, how was the culture? How were the people? Uh, you spoke about Dr. Tomasio, is that right? Uh, Tomasia, I think, yeah. Tomasia. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that time, Eric. It sounds like it was very rich. Yeah, it, it was wonderful. I, I, I think, you know, I always say that I work my best when I work with the best uh, and, and you are exposed to you know, um, novel research, um, and and you're working with, uh, faster pace. I would say, of of research, and and I think I I've just learned so much. Uh, especially that the school was willing to give me an opportunity coming from a complete different background. Uh, in and 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 I flung my GRE subject test. By the way. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> was it in molecular biology? Was it molecular biology? It was oh. so difficult. I, I just didn't really understand what those questions were. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but but you know, I, I think I think growing up being a, such a technical person and always looking at data as zeros and ones. And I think my to, to summarize, you know, I can talk about my my experience at Brown for the next two hours. Um, but but to summarize what I really get out of it the ex the experience working in the lab, uh, working with with biologists, real biologists, um, and, and I think it it promoted this idea for me to look at biological data beyond just zeros and ones, and and I and I think that has been really the meat of that training. Um, uh, and that has actually served me very well in the past decade or so uh, in the biotech industry. Yeah, absolutely. And and what a what a way to be able to bridge your computational knowledge now with the enrichment of having that conversation and learning from biologists as to how biology uh, unfolds itself or unravels and how it molded you to think of of it in in other ways right and and maybe as this energy flow way so so the, but they put you to work 
programming and they put you to work doing stuff in the lab, which I love. I yeah. love that aspect. Uh because, you know, I do see labs where they say, well, we have a wet lab component and they're the specialists over there. And then we have a computational component and they're the programmers and specialists over here. But you were you were immersed in both uh, both these aspects, even at Brown during your Ph.D., there was a lot of programming that you were doing. Yeah, so it was actually part of the requirement. So when I was at Brown, I don't know what the program is today, but when I was there, it was a requirement for me to go through a rotation, for instance, just like everybody else. Yep. So I did three rotations and ultimately settled with the PI that invited me into the program. So I was basically 50% dry and 50% wet uh, for basically throughout the entire duration uh, of my PhD training there. Uh, and I think more and more of those training programs are, are available these days. Um, and I and I think they are wonderful. And I think, uh, you know, learning where the data is coming from, how they generated the data, all the caveats associated with an experiment protocol, and be able to bake some of those requirements into your modeling, into your computational analysis, uh, and then having that that knowledge of even though you're doing computational analysis, but be able to bridge that back into biology, I think oftentimes promote engagement. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, we all been there, uh, sitting in a in a, a seminar, listening to a very technical presentations of a different discipline. Uh, you have 25 minutes, it's often difficult. Um, so having that interdisciplinary training to the bridge between multiple disciplines uh, has been has been resourceful. And and the conversation, I mean, has it been difficult to bridge? Uh, if you were to train other programmers to understand biology, I mean, that that requires a special language that they understand so that you bridge with the concepts that the biologists are are trying to explore. Tell us a little bit about that, because I would find that it's so fascinating as to how how do we do the communication bridging? Yeah, I th I think it's often difficult and it often takes years of learning um to to be able to to bridge that uh, effectively. Um, I can only speak from the way how I manage my team of computational scientists. Uh, is that when they are working on a certain project. Uh, I try my very best to introduce that biological context to what they are doing. Uh, why are we setting this parameter the way it is? Is because of what happened upstream in the lab. Uh, and also to work with them to go through the presentations exercise, uh, teach them that, you know, sometimes we don't have to get too technical about uh, all the details on the on the computational analysis and to be true, people don't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and sort of focus on on the result, the outcome. And if a computational analysis does not generate a desirable outcome, which is often the case, uh, you try to introduce that biological context that would explain why, certain things don't work the way that you would think it should work from a computational perspective. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, so important. You got to then start drawing the pictures, right? <laughs> Go take it to the board, draw the <laughs> diagram. <laughs> oh my. Well, and so, okay. So you, you had this, what it sounds like again, an enriching uh, environment at Brown. How did you make the leap to Stoke Therapeutics? Were you recruited? Uh, did you have to apply for the job? How, how was that transition? Okay. So that, that is another amazing story. 
um, I, I share this multiple times because when the company learned about how I got recruited to Stoke, um, I think everybody found that rather fascinating. So I was at CHOP, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia at that time, but I, I spent most of my time in, in Cambridge. So I, I have a lot of friends here. Decided to, you know, come back and visit friends for a weekend. Uh, and one of my friends was like, oh, don't stay at a hotel, just stay with me. So I stay at his house and he was, he graduated from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And he decided to invite his friends over for, a, a, you know, a private party. And Isabel, the co-founder of Stoke Therapeutics, also graduated from Cold Spring Harbor. Turned out that they were friends. <laughs> and so she showed up and they just, they were still in stealth at that time, uh, looking for a Series A funding uh, to, to start the company. And she was looking for a computational scientist with training in RNA splicing. And there weren't that many of us right, at that time. <laughs> and, and so I didn't know this. We were just talking. And out of the sudden, we started talking about RNA splicing. All right. So obviously, she and I were the cool people at that party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and so she was shocked because she thought I was bioinformatics, but she didn't realize that I actually studied RNA splicing when I, when I, was, uh, when I was in grad school. And so she got excited. So at 10 o'clock at night, she called the CEO and asked if he wanted to talk to me. So that was Friday night. And so Saturday, I went to the office and I spoke with them be on my, uh, before I flew back to Philly. Uh, and then two weeks later, I came back to Boston, did a, did a formal interview with the company. And then they gave me an offer and I joined the company and I think I was number seven or number eight wow. um, of the company. And I was there for seven years, um, seeing the company grow from stealth to series A to series B to IPO to now uh, a drug in the clinic. And they are going for another one uh, relatively soon. That's so exciting. So yeah. exciting. What was it like to be part of that growth uh, during that time? You, you On LinkedIn, you're showing six years and eight months that you spent there. It was tough. I think in the beginning, you know, it was a proof of concept and, and you never know if it was going to work. Um, and we had bad data. We initially thought it was going to work and we received a series of data that suggested that potentially the modality might not be working as, as expected. And I still remember those, those were the dark moments in the very beginning that I think every one of us thought that, you know, we probably should brush up our CVs and, and, you know, preparing for the worst. Um, but through perseverance, um, we decided that we should sort of pivot the modality to something a little bit different. Um, you know, we, we understand that uh, science doesn't fail. It just runs out of money. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so we had to make quick pivot. Uh, we did that and then we were successful in that. We were able to raise our Series A to buy ourselves a little bit more time to prove to the world that what we were doing was worth doing. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was definitely challenging in the beginning. But you know, I think the juice is worth the squeeze. And and I'm very happy to, even though I'm not at Stoke anymore, but still paying a lot of attention to their clinical development. Um, very excited, you know, if if the drug is able to navigate through human proof of concept, and and, and I think it would be so cool to be play to, to play a small role in that process from inception to R and D, uh, and now to clinical. Yeah, yeah, so exciting. So exciting. It must be so rewarding to see that and, and having been part of that. But Eric, you talk about those dark days. How did you get through it? Like, are there any tips? Are there any ways that we should 
be thinking about uh, that, that, or what, what can we do? Uh, who should we talk to during those dark days that make it a little bit lighter and that we can continue to persevere, as you said? Um, I think, you know, if, if your audience is thinking about joining a startup, very early startup, and I think my rule of thumb is that you have to believe in the technology. You cannot approach that as just a job. You have to understand the technology. You have to really believe in the technology that 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 it will work. And I think believing in it <clears throat> is important for for anyone to navigate through the less pleasant data. Um, and be able to persevere through that process and and fight and find lights at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so that will certainly be one thing that I always say, you've got to believe in the technology um, for you to grind through uh, the development of a brand new novel concept. Yeah. And, and when you said, you know, the data was bad. Was it noisy? Was it just the wrong experiments? Was did it not indicate what you guys wanted to indicate? Tell us a little bit about how do we deal with bad data? What does it mean? And 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 how did you guys? How were you able to, you know, uh, superate that or 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 overcome that challenge? At that time, we didn't know what was wrong. I think later on, we realized that they were experimental artifacts uh, where the compounds that we introduced uh, in vitro or in vivo uh, induce potentially some level of cytotoxicity that lead to experimental readouts that are not true. So we are seeing upregulations of relevant target genes that might not mimic what's going to happen in cells or in tissues. Um, and But we were operating with the assumptions that the data that we got was real, uh, but we were not able to translate a lot of this early in vitro work into in vivo, uh, because I think what we were what we were observing were mostly experimental artifacts. But upon realizing that, uh, we were able to pivot the, the strategy uh, and, and be able to generate a, a collection of data that, that we were able to translate into much further along uh, in the drug discovery pipeline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it, it's so, so interesting uh, to, to hear that trajectory, right? And, and to hear how to... Uh, take what would seem to be, you know, failures or, yeah, you know, things that go bad, but to be able to step back and observe uh, that and look at it from a perspective of what can we learn from this data and how should we pivot, as you said, and, and, and readjust. So, um, so okay, so you you were at Stoke, and then from Stoke you went uh, into Orna Therapeutics. Tell us a little bit. I know you you're fairly recent at Orna Therapeutics, but tell us a little bit about that transition. Tell us a little bit about um, how how that went about. Uh, yeah. So I was at a conference last year at. World Bio IT Conference in Boston, um, and and the hiring manager approached me. We got to know each other from the conference, and then he reached out and say, you know, there might be an opportunity that um I might be interested in. Uh, so this role is a little bit different. So I always have the um ambition in automation. Uh, and, and, you know, with automations, with high throughput, it comes with a bunch of other caveats that you have to, you have to deal with. Uh, one is reproducibility. And, and so I think the company is interested in building this data culture uh, that would facilitate um, reproducibility uh, as well as automate 
drug discovery as a platform as much as possible, such, such that for any downstream data and analysis that we look at, we are able to trace back to, say, an entry in a lab notebook, uh, electronic lab notebook these days, uh, and you're able to see the, the path, how this data evolved through the company, and how much can we learn once we have uh, that information. Uh, the metadata, the data, can we apply machine learning and potentially artificial intelligence uh, on these relationships, uh, not just for the sake of automations, but also to learn from the failures that we have and to learn from the successes that, that we have. Because right now, I think in most places, whether it's academia or, or the industry, a lot of these data are fragmented and they are in silo. Uh, and it's our, our ambitions to, can we group them together in a way to ask even more engaging scientific questions? Yeah. So, so I never done this before. Uh, and somebody took a risk again <laughs> to hire me to do this. So it has been it has been an interesting uh experience, not just solely within a scientific arm of the company, but also have that exposure to the operational side of the company. Uh, and I think that transition has been quite interesting. I I can imagine exciting to not yeah. only just interesting. Uh, because it seems like you you gravitate towards the challenges and you you run for them, uh, maybe even even from from your young age upbringing and and uh, with your siblings too, I can imagine. <laughs> but so, Eric, tell us a little bit. Um, I I um, we hear this time again for for the recommendation for people scientists to go to conferences go to conferences because you broaden your network you meet new people uh you found your next opportunity there and uh so you know that that uh, that would not have happened had you not attended that conference and so maybe you know just the just a briefly what what does conferences do to our careers and what it can do to somebody who is looking for opportunities like you or or like you did i i think i think going to conference presenting whether a poster or on a podium i think i think you're putting yourself out there and that's a good thing right um, whether or not you're going to see an immediate benefit from from doing that, I think is irrelevant. I think I think it's more important about putting yourself out there, potentially uncomfortable or not very comfortable um, environment for some people. Putting yourself out there, meeting with people, uh, and you know the opportunity might not occur immediately. But as you do it more and more often, you increase the likelihood of getting that opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when those opportunities showed up, how you deal with them is entirely up to you. But I would say, you know, it is helpful. And if the lab that you are in has the capital resource for you to attend conferences, I would do it. Uh, and again, I don't know the return of investment of, of that, but but I think the more you do it, the more you put yourself out there, uh, you increase the likelihood of opportunities presented itself. Absolutely, absolutely. There's nothing. It, it, there's it's not a bad choice if you can afford to go and you can uh, put yourself out there, as you said, present, present a poster, present a talk, whatever you can do to put yourself out there. Um, cause I know I've gone to, I've, I've gone to conferences and, and, you know, just, just been a fly in the wall and just observing, uh, but what it's when you put yourself out there and you start meeting people and you force yourself to get out of your shell a little bit and, and start, uh, interacting with people. That's when it gets good. So Back to ornotherapeutics, which is such an awesome concept here. Uh, 
that you're that you're putting forward here it's the it's the uh where the, it's the providence of the data and where it comes from and how has it been curated or how has it been uh, managed as it's progressed and what was good data what was an as good data what drove us this direction or that direction i think that's so fascinating is there a wet component or is it only uh, a data and analytics type of company uh no yeah we have a web component it's a drug discovery company that um that leverages circular RNA as a therapeutic modality for various types of diseases. Uh, my role comes in to, as you mentioned, provenance is something that not many people talk about. Um, and and you, you can imagine that in a biotech setting that you have uh, people come and go, you have interns, you have co-ops, you have vendors, you have contractors. Um, and what I typically like to call uh, the data somehow becoming an institutional knowledge. And every time when you have someone walks out that door, that knowledge goes with that person. And it happens all the time in academic labs as well. You know, you're going through PhD cycle, postdocs, and, and we see it all the time that when a postdoc leaves, that work is either never work on anymore or the next person would have to start basically from scratch. Uh, but can we be a little bit more productive in trying to capture the institutional knowledge in something that is more measurable? That, that is a, a interface, a place where you can go, look at a piece of data that was done three years ago, and you're still able to make sense out of it. Uh, and I think collectively, not just at Orna, but collectively in the scientific field, imagine that you, you click on a paper from nature, instead of a stale figure one, if you can click on the data and it shows you the provenance of where that data came from, I, I, I think it will, it will do wonder to, to scientific discovery. I agree. I agree. I think it's it's such an important aspect of of what you're doing. And you know, you introduced us to this concept by talking about reproducibility and how we can how we can use that data uh chasing if you want data analytics to look at the reproducibility and so that we're not uh being influenced by artifacts that might take us down the wrong road uh so fascinating and what a what a wonderful uh window uh that you've opened for us here today um are, are there any parting words? Are there any questions that I didn't ask you that you wish I would have asked you? Um, I don't know. I think, how, how much time do we have left? <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple of minutes left here. Uh, up to you. Let, I mean, let it, let it go. <laughs> tell us, tell us what's on your mind. If you had one last, one last lecture to give and one last uh, lesson to give, um, what would that be? Well, that's a heavy question. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think, um, I think philosophically speaking, I think, um, you know, I think the purpose of life is to pass it on. Um, you know, I think it can be, it can be genetics when you have a child. Uh, it, it also could be, experience a knowledge that matters to you that you want to pass it on so so i think if i knew i was going to die tomorrow and and this interview is my memoir um I, I think i would structure my lecture around um the quote that i heard from trevor noah uh and and he say that your dreams are limited by the information that you have um you you, you know i i never 
never really thought about it that way, right? Because growing up, people always told me, Eric, go for your dreams. And, and famous people say something similar all the time. Uh, Steve Jobs would say, dream bigger. But, but I think what Trevor say has made me realize that, well, how am I supposed to dream about a thing if I don't even know the thing exists? Um, so so I think I think just to to, to summarize my thought on, on this interview, I, I think that has taught me to be even more curious, uh, to, to learn to be comfortable, comfortable about being in the unknown uh, and, and to ask questions. You know, if I ask a bad question, I learn something. But if I ask a good question, you learn something. Uh, and, and, and I think the common denominator is that the interaction is that someone is always learning and, and how we apply what we have learned is, is then entirely up to the individual. Well, we've learned so much <laughs> today from this interview. And I really, really want to thank you so much uh, for taking time uh, to speak to us and, and open up uh, a little bit of your life and, uh, letting us peer into that window and get, helping us meet you uh, a little bit more. Uh, Dr. Eric Lim, the Director of Data and Informatics at Orna Therapeutics. Thank you so much for being our Pathfinder today. I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Tommy. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us once again. And remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.